Hi, hello again, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This is the seventh in your eight-part series to complement the in-person training for the Seattle Heritage Response Team. These programs are made possible through the generous grant funding support of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We'll have our final program in two weeks' time on salvaging wooden and upholstered furniture. After that program concludes, I will email you all with your record of webinar attendance. Please make sure that you've completed viewing all eight programs before the next in-person training session on Thursday and Friday, November 1st and 2nd. Before we begin the presentation, just a quick refresher of technical notes. On your screen, you'll see several boxes, including one labeled chat on the left-hand side. As with past programs, you can use this box to say hello and ask questions, and share any information and links that you'd like. Uh, if you post a question there in the chat box, you'll receive a written response from me and then I will collect all programs to verbally ask them of Randy at the conclusion of the program. Uh, today we have a resource posted there in the web links box at the bottom of your screen. So as with past programs, just click on it to highlight it in blue and then click the Browse To button to visit that site. And with that, I'm very pleased to introduce you all to today's presenter, Randy Silverman. Randy has served as Preservation Librarian at the University of Utah's Marriott Library since 1993. He teaches workshops on disaster planning for the Western States and Territories Preservation Assistance Service, aka WestPass, and is recognized for his national disaster recovery efforts. Randy has 80 professional publications and has presented professional lectures or workshops in 30 states and 13 foreign countries. He was awarded the American Library Association's Bank Harris Preservation Award in 2013, received a Fulbright Specialist Award in 2014, and was given the Utah Academy of Sciences, Arts, and Letters Gardner Prize for Outstanding Academic Contributions in 2016. Randy is also a member of the National Heritage Responders and has shared his depth of knowledge with that group for many years now. And with that, I'd like to turn things over to Randy for his presentation. Thank you very much, Jess, for your kind introduction and for all your hard work for getting teams on the ground in North Carolina and for everything you do. You're a fabulous resource and we're all grateful. Good morning, everyone. And um, I'm going to just pitch into this. So the bottom line is there are natural causes and man-made causes for disaster recovery. And I'm going to talk about storms to begin with. This is um, a picture of Hurricane Katrina, which was a 2005 hurricane uh, that uh, totaled about $125 billion in damage. This is a picture uh, after Hurricane Aniki in Hawaii in 1992, which was about a $3 billion storm. And they keep coming, of course. They keep rolling ashore. This is a tropical uh, storm in Houston uh, in 2001. And the law library filled up with water. and whether or not there is water attached to the uh, immediate disaster, sometimes there are other things, there are fires. Um, there often are uh, incidents um, to, for us all to be concerned about with wet material. And so the place I'm going to begin is with um, the process of dealing with wet material. This is Colorado State University's Morgan Library in 1997, which went under the first floor went underwater and remained underwater for 24 hours and about 425,000 books got wet. And um, it was a surprise to people. It was sort of unforeseen, but things happen. And of course, if we stand around wondering why these things happened, the mold follows. This is a, um, a picture in Biloxi after Hurricane Katrina. And that's kind of the inevitable. So we're up against a time constraint. That's not to suggest that anyone should put themselves at risk or you know, become harmed or put anyone at risk because of the, the situation, but calm minds will prevail. So we wanna think about prioritizing our recovery effort. What do we want to deal with first? And the bottom line for me is, and this is a personal um, assessment, I suppose, but when you've got coated, coated paper, um, the, the uh, coatings in some cases will stick together and that may be uh, a problem that cannot be overcome. So the, the nature of um, coatings on paper, so think about Time Magazine, just slick papers in general, is some of those coatings are water soluble. And so 
to prevent them from sticking together, we have a couple of options. One of them is to slip sheet uh, a, a piece of um, a material in between the leaves of the, um, the coated papers so that they won't have a chance to adhere as they dry. That can be um, a sheet of silicon release paper. Wax paper works less well, but it, it will suffice. Um, sheets of Holitex work well, so Holitex being Pellon or um, um, interfacing if, if you're at the fabric store. But the trick is that they have to be separated. We don't know which coatings are going to stick when they're wet, but some of them may. And so it's a problem. And differentiating which materials have coated, coated papers um, early in the process is a key. Some books have um, images that are printed on uh, slick paper and it's just a little section of the book and it's in the center of the book, you may not notice it on first pass, but if you miss the fact that those were coated sheets and the books get a chance to dry, the coatings will be the first to dry and, and it's irreversible when they block together. With microfilm, the uh, theory is that once it's gotten wet, we have to keep, again, separate the the microfilm from itself or it will adhere to itself. The coating in the case of microfilm is gelatin and that's an adhesive. So when it gets wet, it swells and when it dries, it'll adhere to itself. So keeping um, microfilm wet and taking it back to a vendor who produces microfilm and running it through the machine again that originally um, produced it is one way to dry uh, microfilm. It actually can be rolled out and air dried, but it's going to be tricky to have a, a place to do that just because of the dimensions of microfilm. And photographs all told are going to, oh look at that, my voice cracked, is that exciting? Um, photographs all told will um, adhere to themselves, so if you have a box of photographs, um, it's it's not unlikely that uh, some or all of them will block together. Simply separating those out while they're still wet on any surface. Here we, we see a table that's been lined with paper, but they could be on the floor as well. We'll prevent them from sticking together. And that's a major step if it's possible. So knowing something about your collections in advance is helpful. Often you get called in though to help people and uh, they you don't know their collection. and so. Um, figuring out what's going on and being able to apply logic to the recovery process is a, is a way to go. Um, if to be um, efficient in terms of space, photographs can be um, dried in, um, um, let's see, I'm trying to get to my pointer here. We, we can dry uh, photographs in a stack. And let's see, here's the pointer. Let's see if that will work. So, yeah, there it is. So what we have is essentially um, a board, which is just represents the bottom of the pile. Blotter, which can be uh, any absorbent uh, material. Blotter being absorbent paper, uh, paper board, but it can also be news newspaper, for instance, or paper towels, any absorbent material a photograph in the center of this or a number of photographs and with the image face up and then a sheet of Holitex or Pellon so uh, on the surface of the image so that it will not adhere to the second layer of blotter and a board on top and a weight on top of that. And so the nature of this um, assemblage is that you can stack things up vertically. Here we see a number of um, uh, book jackets that got uh, wet when the books got wet, so they were separated from the books and they're being dried between sheets of blotter, this being the blotting paper uh, that Jeff is holding there, and uh, with a sheet of Holitex on the top of the uh, dust jacket so that the uh, coating does not adhere to the, um, the blotter. If you don't know which side is coated, for instance, both sides of a dust jacket could be coated, or in the case of a negative, a photographic negative, it may be diff difficult to differentiate between the coated side and the uncoated side. Just put a sheet of Holitex um, on both sides. And again, Holitex is, is available as Pellon from your local 
sewing store and you can buy it by the yard it's it's available um so let's see if i can make that go away okay so we basically create a, a stack and we can build it up fairly high the blotter will absorb the water out of the photographs so if we leave this stack um, under pressure for some time several hours maybe when things first got wet and then exchange the wet blotter for dry blotter and, and recreate the stack and keep it under pressure. The water will continue to come off the, either the photographs or the, um, the coated papers and uh, it will dry in time. Basically, it'll take three or four exchanges of blotter and or newspaper and or uh, paper towels to get this material dry. So those are that might be a priority if we can figure out how to deal with the coated material in a collection. Pack out indicates um, a decision. If we're in a building that got wet, the question is, did the one room get wet? And can we work within the building to take things out of the wet room and dry them within the, uh, the rest of the building? Or is the building itself so wet that it would make no sense to try and dry anything inside? So we're going to have to remove things. Removing things from a building is uh, puts things at risk. You can damage material by moving it around. Things can get stolen because they've moved into a non-secure area. So it is a decision. This is Colorado State University where 425,000 books uh, got wet, as I said earlier, and they were removed from the library and uh, taken to freezers where they were stabilized. And so the trick was to get a standard paperboard box a standard size paperboard box and line it with a black plastic garbage bag so that it becomes um, uh, a watertight container. And then uh, packing out all of that wet material and taking it to a freezer. Noting where the material came from within the, the space, there were hundreds of thousands of books. So it's uh, not possible to identify which, which book was in which box, but the boxes were taken out in sequentially from this entire first floor that had gotten wet and so they uh, there was some sense of where the call number ranges happened within that floor so they things could be tracked while they were frozen and um, prior to freeze drying things could be moved to a temporary uh, building you can create one they could be moved to a different part of the building you're in or to a different building on campus or in in town um, and they're, they're, you know, we can work with things better in a, um, uh, in a dry space. But freezing is the great secret. If this is unknown to you, this is a, a, a wonderful secret. This is a wonderful asset. We can slow down the process of mold forming by freezing material. And in fact, if we get coated papers frozen before they have a chance to start drying out and blocking, they can uh, be dealt with in a frozen state more effectively than trying to uh, interleave all of these pages that that um, were wet and uh, with, say, Holitex or um, um, uh, wax paper. So freezing can be done in a chest freezer like this. This is uh, Yuri Polonchensky at the Czech National Library after the 2002 uh, European floods. This is the British Library's cold storage unit where they actually can flash freeze their books. They have enough wet material in, in the British Library, or it, it happens frequently enough that things get wet, that they uh, installed a flash freezer in the building uh, when they rebuilt the building, the new building. So it's it's a you know it's a wonderful thing to be able to uh fall back on freezing and again timing is is very critical how how many days or or minutes or hours will it take to move uh x amount of material into another space if you only have 50 books you can dry those and i'll talk about that in a moment um but if it's a, a huge number of uh, of books that are wet all at the same time it really makes sense to slow down the process of trying to dry them by just stabilizing them in freezers. And commercial freezers work great. This is the material from Colorado State University uh, inside those boxes with the black plastic garbage bags lining them. And they're um, 
put into those, these pallets and uh, it's a commercial freezer so things are kept stable and you can pile them up um, as high as the ceiling. Notice that there are frozen peas on the right side of the slide. So it's a commercial freezer in use. Um, and those books were molding. It took 14 days to pack the books out of the, um, the first floor of the Colorado State University Morgan Library. And after day three, things started molding and progressed all the way through day 14. So I asked the freezer um, manager, what did he think about moving all this molded material into his you know, food, food uh, handling facility? And he said, ah, I'm not worried about it. The peas were uh, sealed up before they came in here. So, but I never eat frozen peas without thinking about that guy. <laughs> so the, uh, the drawing techniques I'm gonna describe are um, um, beginning with the simplest, um, are five different techniques. And this is uh, related to a, a grant that I worked on with folks from the British Library and the Czech National Library and some folks around the US. We got a grant from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training in 2004 to compare drying techniques and figure out if one was actually preferable to another in terms of the outcome for the books. So air drying is the technique most commonly uh, adopted because it's uh, readily available. We just have to separate material and spread it out and wait for evaporation to happen. This is in Biloxi in, um, after Hurricane Katrina and Gary Frost and I are busy uh, drying out material that really has uh, nowhere else to go except to be free, uh, air dried. So we're spreading out uh, books and uh, things were starting to mold uh, in, in Mississippi as well. Um, but the bottom line is the sooner we could air them out, the quicker they would dry and the, the mold problem would um, be eliminated. In fact, when we got to this university library, the librarian was busy bagging all of the books as they molded. So he put them in a black plastic garbage bag and tie a knot to keep them from infecting the rest of the material. Um, that's that that logic is based on a uh, a weak understanding of what causes mold, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But spreading things out will allow uh, air dry air to pass over uh, material, and it will evaporate if there's enough air flow. And this was in a in a place that was very hot and humid following Hurricane Katrina, yet things were still drying out. If we created uh, airflow created fan movement of air, it really helps. And so uh, again, we're spreading out all materials that were, were wet and allowing the airflow. This is in my lab some years ago, notice the fan on the bottom of the photograph. That's very key to the process. If we move the air past the books, it, it allows for evaporation. Notice that the books are being held open by velo binding combs, which are, have become a rare commodity, but it used to be pretty common. And it's nice to be able to hold the book open so the fan can reach uh, the wet material at the back of the, the fold. And as I said, you can dry a whole lot of books. The question is, what's your limit? Where, where are you comfortable um, with the process of allowing things to air dry? And when is it uncomfortable? There's nothing to preclude your drying um, 100 books or 200 books today and maybe that'll take four days to get those materials dry and freezing the rest and then taking those out of the freezer after uh, this lot is is dried and pressed and um, move exchanging them for more wet books. So freezing is not going to do anything to dry things. It just allows us to stabilize them and it buys us time. So books can be preferentially dried like this so the boards are drying and uh, large heavy books can be held open like this so they're supported and we're not trying to stand them up to sustain the weight of, on the binding, uh, which makes it more difficult to do that. But the, the secret to all of this is paper expands when it gets wet and it shrinks some when it dries, but especially machine made paper does not return to its original shape. So it will be larger than when, uh, before it was wet out, which is what's going to cause cockling. The nature of cockling 
is a physical response to the fact that the paper, um, the, the tension in the paper was kind of released. The paper was made on a machine and it, it was formed under tension. And um, when it got wet, things started to expand and then they'll shrink again, but not completely. So if we can dry a book and then apply pressure to it, we can minimize that distortion. And so here's a picture of pressing books that have been wet and air dried. And after several days, we'll squeeze books in a press overnight and then open them up to allow air to circulate again the next day. And we'll continue to vacillate back and forth between air drying and um, applying pressure until we're convinced the book is totally uh, dry. We don't begin this until the material is um, dry to the touch, meaning I can put my hand in the back of the book and it's cold because of the water content that's still in the paper, but it is not physically wet. So we'll wait until they um, have air dried to a certain stage and then start pressing it and then we'll air dry it some more and press it the next night. And squeezing it overnight will not cause it to mold and will help with the distortion. It will not cure it. But things can be dried in a variety of ways. Uh, and uh, here we see things up, up on a clothesline or on the surface of a, a table. Getting uh, framed material out of the frame is a, a great idea because the frame will trap moisture. And so if we can eliminate that trapped moisture and expose things to the air, things will air dry. If uh, people are not familiar with how framing works, Learning on uh, wet material is really a tough way to learn because the material is more fragile. Turns out that there's lots of ways to attach uh, prints and photographs to mats and uh, many of them are horrible and include tape and dealing with those issues while you're learning to unframe things is the wrong time to do it. So it would be a good idea to learn about framing beforehand and it, would be, it might be a great idea to get people involved who deal with framed uh, objects and are familiar with the process of taking frames off of things. But again, just getting air to move um, will create a drying scenario. This was a flood, uh, this is the result of a flood that happened at the Archives of Ontario some years ago, and the material was dried in town through dehumidification inside an abandoned grocery store. So here we see large dehumidifiers that are uh, operating outside the building and putting uh, very dry air, like 25% relative humidity air inside the building. And the way this works is with uh, a des desiccant wheel. And so the nature of a desiccant is like that little white um, uh, material, that white thing that they put in the pill bottle to keep your vitamins dry. So that's a desiccant, which is a salt that's, that is uh, gonna preferentially absorb moisture out of the air. So a desiccant dehumidifier has a system that pushes air through a, a rotating desiccant wheel and uh, which will strip out the moisture from the air and the process also includes a heat cycle that redries that desiccant wheel so that it continually uh, operates and uh, uh, can be used to put dry air inside of a building. This is Colorado State uh, University after that flood in the basement. So the three floors above the basement had to be dried so that the humidity downstairs wouldn't cause this building to mold. And the whole building is hermetically sealed and the air conditioning system failed when that flood happened. So the, dealing with the, the, um, the wet, wet problem, the moisture problem in the air throughout the building is also a concern and mold is, is going to occur if the conditions are right, which includes moisture in the air. This is inside of that grocery store uh, in Ontario. So papers are being taken out of the uh, archival boxes, spread out on these kind of rickety screen drying uh, racks. The air is being moved all through the building and it's 25% relative humidity air. So things are drying out nicely and they put them back in folders and put the folders in boxes and send them back over to the archive. And things work out this way. It was very effective. And in addition to paper, they were drying uh, cassette recordings and um, negatives. The idea of pinning a negative to the image like that is not so great, but you get the idea. You can dry a, a variety of media. These are 
um, uh, sound recordings, a reel-to-reel -reel sound recording. So in this experiment uh, that we were doing with the grant money from the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, we used thermal drying just to see what it did to the material because it was the technique that was used uh, in Florence after the Florence flood of 1966. And so in the Czech Republic, they uh, came up with a, a place that was being used to dry lumber. And so they uh, got access to it and we dried books in a thermal chamber, which basically just shuts material up inside of the chamber and adds uh, hot air and circulates it and, and the lumber dries out essentially. And in this case, the books were dried out. The books are being stacked between uh, ceramic tiles with Holitex uh, separating the book from the tile so the covers when they had water soluble adhesives um, impregnated into the cover material didn't stick to the tiles. So the door was closed and the heat was turned on and we dried that stuff and I'll show you a slide at the end of the sequence of five drying techniques and two sterilization techniques that we experimented with to show you how they came out. So I'll keep that in, you know, I'll keep you in suspense for a few moments, if you will. So vacuum freeze drying is the technical choice that is uh, most commonly used for drying masses of uh, wet book material and also archival material. And uh, this is a, a vacuum freeze drying chamber uh, that was actually uh, designed and built by Kirk Lively, seen here um, in his younger days uh, from the back. And Kirk is busy putting a bunch of books into this uh, freeze drying chamber. Kirk runs uh, Belfour in uh, Fort Worth, Texas, and is a good friend to the library community when it comes to trying to deal with disasters. So he built this chamber out of, it's basically a huge steel box with ribs that keep the chamber from uh, collapsing on itself when he pulls a vacuum. The books can also be constrained uh, in the freeze drying scenario, uh, which will help eliminate uh, distortion in the paper. This, however, will increase the drying time significantly, like by 50% or more. So it will raise the cost of the process. But for valuable books, this is uh, recommended. So the chamber is, is closed and a vacuum is pulled. And inside of a vacuum, if you add, uh, actually everything inside the chamber was frozen before it was put inside. So the, the books are um, frozen. But if you put them inside of a vacuum chamber and pulled a vacuum, they would eventually freeze in that state anyway. So in a vacuum, the water is, it cannot exist as water. So it's below the triple point of water. And so it will turn to ice. A small amount of heat is added and that causes sublimation to occur. So basically the, the ice crystals are turned to gas and expelled out the back of the machine um, to dry the books. Inside the British Library, they have not only that um, flash freezing uh, flash freezer, but they have this uh, little Virtus um, uh, vacuum freeze drying system. And they figured out that they could put a jack inside there to keep things squeezed nice and tight, which allows the books to dry flat. And they can put metal plates between uh, the books to try and uh, give some stiffness to uh, that that um, drying process. And so the books are closed up inside the chamber, they pull a vacuum, they sublimate the moisture out. Every couple of days, they'll open it up. And of course, with the ice sublimating away, it's not so much, there's not so much pressure anymore. So they take a look at the books, put them back in and jack up the pressure again and dry them under pressure until they're dried. Vacuum packing is an interesting system in that the process is to put the book inside of a, a, a bag with absorbent material that will um, draw the moisture out of the book. And then the bag itself is sealed. And so um, when it's sealed, it pulls a complete vacuum inside of the bag. So that pulls the bag very closely around the, um, the book and where there's dry newspaper in there, the water from the book will travel into uh, the newspaper by capillary action. And uh, as the newspaper gets wet, the bags are opened again and uh, the material is, the wet material 
is exchanged for dry newspaper or whatever you're using for drying and the bag is resealed. This takes a lot of time in that you, you have to replace that drying material about 20 times. However, things dry really flat. It's kind of an ideal way to dry books in that there is um, pressure and the water's being extracted at the same moment. So if you squeeze things to hold them flat and extract the moisture at the same time, things will dry um, very flat. I should note, I can hear Gary thinking in the background, but you're not mentioning blocking. Again, uh, from before, uh, I mentioned the idea that if the papers are coated papers, they, uh, they have to be separated. So we can't use any of these systems. You can air dry books um, that have coated papers. You can vacuum freeze dry them. So if you get them frozen before the paper blocked, that will work. Uh, vacuum freeze drying actually works uh, pretty well. There, I've seen a couple examples of things that actually block together and it's, it's not clear why some, adhes some papers contain uh, material that acts as an adhesive um, that just, uh, it's the way it is. And some, some don't. Some coated papers uh, that would block together normally can be freeze dried and they will not stick together. This system requires pressure. And so in fact, if it's a coated stock paper, it, you can't do it to, this, uh, to those papers until they're dry. So for instance, you could air dry a book up to the point that there was no longer active moisture in the paper and then put it in this vacuum freeze drying, or sorry, uh, um, uh, vacuum packing system, applying the pressure from the vacuum packing to remove the, the remainder of the water and to allow the book to dry under pressure. The interesting thing about this system is that it removes all the, all the air so in fact, um, it is a vacuum and mold will not, will not grow inside the bag as long as it truly is a sealed um, vacuum. The vacuum press is a, a very inexpensive version of the uh, vacuum packing system. Vacuum packing machines are expensive, like $10,000 or more. The vac vacuum press is like $300. So it's a little, a little version. It doesn't really do as much for the material in, in that it can't apply a true vacuum. But it, it works pretty well. Um, keeping the bag sealed is a trick. That blue line has to be, um, as the machine pulls the air out of the bag, that blue line is rubbed and the, the bag holds together. Uh, and as long as the seal's not disturbed, it will uh, apply pressure to the book and the water will travel out of the wet book into the newspaper by capillary action. But the seal sometimes breaks and so some of them uh, don't, uh, you know, you think it's done, but actually it's, it's not really sealed. So there's a sealed version. And so while we were doing all of this experimentation, the Czechs were busy um, inventing the multifunctional vacuum chamber to actually address the material that was flooded in uh, the Czech Republic. And that's what the machine looks like. It remains the only example of this uh, technology in the world, as far as I know. It's really a fascinating machine. Very, uh, the development of the machine is a phenomenon. The people that, are, that did it are extremely bright. So they used, um, uh, they, they call it lifelization, but it's a vacuum, pack, uh, vacuum uh, pulling system. And the books are kept uh, upright in this kind of a rack system separated by unglazed ceramic tiles and they're put inside the chamber in a frozen condition and um, they're separated uh, by the, these little spacers on these tiles. You can see the ice crystals at the head of the book. And we're in America, we want to know if the chamber itself maintained a vacuum during the entire process. Uh, the Czechs want to know the exact drying condition of every single book in the chamber at all times. So they track every book as they dry it and they can pull out the ones that are dry first and, and leave the others to continue drying. And so they seal up the chamber and pull a vacuum. And in that machine, they can do various things. If they want, they can pull a vacuum. They can also just circulate air. So they actually can air dry stuff in the machine and they can circulate uh, sterilization material inside the machine, ethylene oxide. So it's a pretty phenomenal machine. Um, in the background is Barclay Ogden. You can see uh, the, the gray-haired 
um, goatee. That is the guy who uh, began West Pass and was our fearless leader for 10 years. Right, Gary? So sterilization. Um, we experimented with two different approaches, ethylene oxide and gamma radiation. And um, there is, there's some kind of misinformation about these, so I'd like to touch on the idea of sterilization for a moment. Sterilization should never be entered into uh, casually. It, 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 of course, is going to introduce some major changes to the material, but in the book world or in the archives world, it's um, possible that it could be um, a, um, a requisite um, option. For instance, when there's flooding, if there's standing water in uh, a community or in a building, it uh, is not unlikely that it will cause sewage to rise and so the water may be contaminated with sewage or other materials. And if there's a health risk to handling the material after it's dry, uh, that would certainly be an occasion to st start considering the option of sterilization. So this is an ethylene oxide chamber owned by Sterogenics. Um, Ethylene oxide is used in industry for things like sterilizing catheters and stents and wound care dressings. So the variables in ethylene oxide sterilization include the time up for the exposure, the temperature and humidity of the material being treated, and there's a pretreatment step to control for um, uh, too much humidity, and then the concentration of the ethylene oxide in the chamber uh, based on the size of the ethylene oxide chamber. The, um, the question about off-gassing is where people get really nervous. So the, the uh, ethylene oxide process uh, can, what? Uh, includes preconditioning of the material, the sterilization process itself, and aeration, which meets uh, OSHA specifications for uh, workplace safety. And as I described above, it's used for things like stents. You know, if you're going to put a stent in someone's heart, you can be absolutely certain that there is no um, ethylene oxide left in that stent, period, that uh, it's used for wound care dressings. So the off-gassing process is very carefully controlled, and it, it does not linger in books. People who have had things uh, sterilized by ethylene oxide are worried about um, the odor that's contained in the material. And uh, it is not ethylene oxide. It is um, probably residue of the material that was in the book. For instance, uh, dead mold will stink. Some kinds of uh, sewage and, and other byproducts of the flood will have a, uh, an odor that may be long lasting. So uh, ethylene oxide is uh, one of our options, and the other one is gamma radiation. And this is a, a picture of a commercial uh, um, gamma radiation uh, setup. Also, uh, the slide is from Sterogenics. And what is used is radioisotope cobalt-60 as the energy source. And this kind of sterilization is used for pharmaceuticals, and horticultural supplies and medical devices and cosmetics. And so you see the results of these kinds of processes, the sterilization process in our world. The, the, um, you know, we're consumers downstream of sterilization, which is a, a large industry in the US. With uh, gamma radiation, the technical variables include how much time is in the cell and basically What's happening in this picture is there uh, are containers that are going to pass by the uh, radiation source, and uh, there, so the amount of time that is that this material is uh, in uh, contact with the isotope load is one of the variables, and the density of the material is another, and um, and this is controllable by the product conveyance speed. So we can, uh, we can sterilize material fairly easily uh, using uh, gamma radiation, but there's some, some downsides to gamma radiation. So we'll visit that here in one second. 
physically what was happening with those drying techniques um, can be compared with machine made papers uh, each of these books was uh, produced in the 1940s and so we have machine made paper and as you can see the air dried paper can be um, controlled uh, in the drying process by squeezing it between uh, drying phases fairly well vacuum freeze drying is going to um, leave what people consider an acceptable amount of um, uh, physical um, change, physical distortion. Thermal drying, things were uh, dried under that, uh, under some pressure, though that those stacks of books were pressed by um, concrete blocks and there's some distortion. Um, the vacuum packing, it came out fairly flat and the vacuum press came out um, flat as well. With uh, handmade papers, the drying result is um, better all, all across the board. But you'll see with the thermal drying in the center, the discoloration in the paper, thermal drying is cooking that paper. And so we get um, physical changes in the material. In this case, the sizing in the paper is being um, uh, baked out of the paper. It's evaporating out to the edges and discoloring. In the Florence flood, the, uh, the thermal drying process was very damaging. So there's no question it's not an optimal way to go. But uh, notice these are all handmade papers. These books are um, were uh, printed before 1800. So they're all handmade sheets. And the air drying looks very good. And the vacuum uh, freeze drying looks, looks much better, frankly. And the vacuum packing and the vacuum press uh, come out um, equally flat. So thermal drying dry stuff, but it, it cooks it. And so by cooking it, it degrades the material physically. And so the testing we did was basically um, stressing things uh, physically to find out what the changes were uh, in the paper strength. And what we found was the 1.0 line, that yellow line is uh, completely non-damaging. So that would be a complete success. We found that we, we were trying to use, and this is um, maybe an error in judgment on my part, uh, in that we wanted to use real books in the testing, but I was committed to the idea of actually figuring out what a real book's going to do, and I don't want to get too carried away trying to create surrogates. So we use real books, but that created noise in the data. So there is a variable uh, in the um, data outcomes that couldn't be attributed to that, uh, to the variations in paper that we were uh, able to use for the tests. So air drying is, is essentially a non-damaging technique. In fact, they're all non-damaging until we get to thermal drying, which uh, degraded the paper strength by 20%, and gamma radiation, which degraded the paper strength by 25%, and ethylene oxide comes out like a champ, um, non-damaging. So it's, it's notable that when we cook things, either by heat or by radiation, it degrades the cellulose in the book and causes physical damage that's irreparable. And so if you're choosing to use a sterilization material, it's important to note that gamma radiation will have a long-term impact. If you're sterilizing records, for instance, uh, uh, that have a seven-year life expectancy and then they're going to be culled from a collection, seven years will not show up as a problem and that would be, uh, gamma would be simple and it would be uh, expeditious and a little bit less expensive possibly than ethylene oxide. But if it's long, if the material is designed for long-term retention, for permanent retention, I cannot uh, recommend the use of gamma radiation. Um, sometimes we're dealing with uh, either fires or um, soot as a result of a fire. And so this is a, a, a fire that happened in a library uh, in Colorado. This is um, an arson-related fire. The upper floors of the building had fire sprinklers in them, fire suppression. The bottom floor did not. And in fact, that's where the arson set the fire. So that is, you know, it was known um, at that point, what, what was going to happen if they started a fire in the basement. And so, um, the, the, after a fire, the result is uh, evidence of soot on all material. 
And soot is not dust. It's the byproduct of the uncombusted material that went through the, that came through the fire, the fuel for the fire. And it includes everything. It can include, you know, carpet and adhesives from the carpet and the paint and everything else. And so soot, it does not act like dust, but it acts like uh, an adhesive actually after a while. And it bonds harder to material the longer it sits in contact with the material. And it, uh, um, if you touch things while they're in a sooty condition, you drive the soot into the material. So it's, it's important to try and remove soot uh, expeditiously. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a, um, the result of a fire that happened up in an attic in Sevier County, Utah, which is about two and a half hours south of Salt Lake City. The fire was caused by a welder's um, torch and the attic burned, but the building itself did not catch fire. So there was material in the attic that burned, but the soot filtered down over the entire collection. So all of these um, county record books were um, soot covered. So everything smelled of soot and these are all covered with soot, which is hard to see. But in fact, um, we were dealing with the premise that we were gonna have to remove it. The standard way to remove soot is to use a natural rubber sponge and uh, that's what was used to clean the rest of the building but we tried an experiment we used um, uh, something called dry ice misting which is a process of um, taking dry ice and putting it in uh, one of these uh, dry ice blasting machines or dry ice misting machines which grinds it up grinds a block of dry ice up about the size of sugar. So if you think about a, a sugar crystal, that's about the size that this will come out of the nozzle. And dry ice is extremely cold. The gloves are essential. If you touch this stuff, you can't get it off of you. It, it will burn you and stick to you. But because it's so cold, when it comes out of the nozzle, and this is a difficult slide to read, but if you look at the top of the nozzle, especially in that little bit of shadow from the um, uh, building next to where we were doing this outdoors, you can see it looks a little bit gray. And so that's what's coming out. The dry ice is being ground up the size of sugar and it comes out in, in about um, 15 or 20 pounds per square inch. So it's not under a lot of pressure. It's coming out and it's preferentially freezing the surface of that book. So the soot is getting extremely cold very quickly and the pressure from uh, the nozzle is actually then distributing the soot off of the surface of the book. So what you end up with is a clean surface. And in fact, the dry ice can get into nooks and crannies at the head cap, for instance, and around the edges of the board that are difficult to reach with a sponge. So it, it produced a very good result. We were pleased with the outcome. It can be damaging. It can act like, um, um, a sandblasting system. If your dwell time is too long or the nozzle is too close to the material being cleaned, so having an expert at the um, who's handling the dry ice um, misting process itself is very useful. So mitigation of mold. I would like to touch on the fact that mold is not well understood and it's um, a constant issue. Um, constant because, in fact, it's part of the, uh, the living species on Earth. As you can see from this um, diagram, the fungi represent about three and a half percent of the living species on Earth, where insects are over 50 percent and the animals are about 20 percent and plants are about 20 percent. So the fungi are definitely here and they're not an afterthought. It's not an accident and it's not a crisis that we're having fungi. They exist for a very uh, specific purpose, which is to help keep the planet clean. So it's part of the cleansing system of the planet. And when the, um, these um, microorganisms activate, it's for the purpose of, of um, consuming things that in the natural world seem to be dead or um, just deteriorating, and therefore it's part of the cleaning up crew. So the insects do that for us. They will consume the dead horses 
and the um, buzzards are part of that crew, and the molds. And so the, the triggers for mold activating include having a food source, which in the case of libraries can be books and um, documents. The amount of time that the food source has been at the right conditioning, meaning that it's very humid typically, and then the environmental controls themselves. How warm is it and how humid is it? And you know that we, well, we think, we think of mold as being really active in a place like um, the tropics and it's nice and warm and it could be really moist, but there's also such a thing as having mold grow on the applesauce in the back of your, your refrigerator where it's been sitting for three weeks un, um, undetected. And so um, after a material sits in an environment long enough, there are enough species of molds and there, there are hundreds of thousands of species. They operate in freezing conditions, in uh, temperate conditions, but the general uh, um, trigger, the, the, the consistent part of this puzzle is humidity. So things tend to be moist when we're going to have um, a mold problem. So if I could anthropomorphize mold for just a second, um, think of it as a, as a living critter, right? As, a, as a, a presence. This is the Biloxi Public Library where Gary Frost and I went three weeks after Hurricane Katrina. And we went inside this building, which is um, at this point very, um, um, what, it's, a, it's moist. Those are pine needles that uh, washed in or blew in uh, to the building and the water is drained off. It's three weeks after the storm, but that's about a foot and a half of, of pine needles on the floor, maybe more. And the windows are a little bit broken out. So we're walking around inside this place. It's squishy like a mattress. It's kind of an interesting environment. And there's no mold inside of that library at all, except this is a picture of a, uh, an exhibit case. It's a glass exhibit case up off the floor. It has metal legs. And inside this case, which is only about eight or 10 inches deep, there are baskets and the baskets are gray because they're completely covered in mold. That's, that's a hard picture to take. It's, there's no lighting inside the building. There's, but those are gray baskets because they're completely engulfed in mold where the building itself had no mold. So think about the condition. We have, um, it's, it's the same building inside their rare book area, which was just a little sequestered closet essentially, um, you have map cases and we open one of those up and you know it's doing um, a, a basic home science experiment inside there. It's just uh, growing mold and rusting and going to town. And in fact, even inside of um, file cabinets that were keep, they kept um, archival materials in, we found this example of a book that was inside of a Tyvek fold of Tyvek envelope and it's molding like mad. So inside of that container, it's, it's growing mold. Right next to this, there were um, little booklets just like that one in paper envelopes that were not molding. So if you, know, if you think about the model of air passage, it gives you an idea that the Tyvek envelope is causing a lack of airflow, that glass case is causing a lack of airflow, and it is, I think, one of the critical factors. If you're going to control for mold, creating airflow is essential. It's like, it's for the mold, if you'll go with my image of anthropomorphizing it for a moment, the mold is differentiating between the living and the dead. And its job is to consume the dead. And if the, if the, um, the object in question appears to be um, living, which and the, may be that it's even so simple as showing evidence of air flow, air movement, the, um, the mold doesn't really feel like it's their, their time yet. It's not theirs. But the dead stuff, that applesauce in the saran wrap at the back of your refrigerator, after three weeks, it's fair game, right? So there's a cutoff point. Time is critical. For the for the species to devise whether you know divine whether or not it's it's that's lunch or it isn't, and once it gets activated, it will go like mad. So the trick is going to be closing up our buildings to further water intrusion when that's possible, 
and moving air when that's possible. And actively moving it with fans is certainly a great idea. Sometimes we don't have electricity. So here we're back in Mississippi uh, during Hurricane Katrina recovery, and we're just opening up windows of this tiny little museum. It's a historical museum to get air flow through the building to minimize the incredible mold growth that was going on inside. And you know, when we left, the team uh, that came after us told us that, yeah, they'd close the windows back up again told them that they were really concerned about looters. And meanwhile, the mold just went nuts. So the movement of air, this is a park ranger feeling a cave's breathing hole, right? The, the nature of air movement in caves gave me a clue about this. You know, when was the last time you saw a mold outbreak in a cave? It just seems like there's enough that, of an, and a cave can be extremely wet. I've seen lakes inside of caves and stalagmites and stalactites are formed by dripping water inside of caves. Humidity can be 95% inside of a cave, and yet it's not a mold outbreak just because it's wet, because I think the, the airflow is moving. And we can create, so it, with that little museum in Mississippi, we created cross ventilation just to start moving the air through the building. We can also do that, uh, what's called the Venturi effect, if we can create a large space and have a little space, it, it creates air, uh, air flow. It drafts the air like a chimney. So removing mold, it's pretty straightforward in library world. We wait for the material to dry out. The uh, mold becomes inactive, and that's the secret to mold. If you get the conditions correct, it, it, when, they're, when the conditions are correct, the mold will um, start to uh, form and if we dry the material out sufficiently, the mold doesn't feel that it's the right environment anymore, and it will stop uh, actively um, um, breeding or, or or surviving, living and consuming. Those stains on that paper are caused by the mold itself digesting the cellulose. So what's left is desiccated mold bodies on the surface of the paper, and those can be removed with the HEPA vacuum cleaner. And you can do that work inside of a fume hood if you've got one, because even dry desiccated mold spores are um, will affect some people. It's uh, remember it's it's dead mold that they inoculate you with when you get a penicillin shot. Um, but if you don't have access to a fume hood, going outdoors and just brushing the mold away from your body, getting in in you know so the mold is is going downwind of you so it's not back up in your face, and just brushing things off and removing the surface um, desiccated material. In, in the library world, that's usually what we'll do. We often don't treat the stain that's left on the paper. When the stain on the paper belongs to a Rembrandt, that's different, and we may deal with that print, and the, the visual problem can be uh, corrected, but it's, or improved. Let's stop there, improvement but um, it would have to be sufficiently important to want to go to that length. Usually we just accept um, stains from mold or from water damage as part of the historical evidence of the life of this material. So policies uh, can be put in place and I don't actually know what kind of things you've done in um, Seattle or in Washington generally. In Utah, we did something um, uh, for the state's emergency plan by creating an annex to that plan uh, under uh, the emergency support function 11, ESF 11, which addresses cultural property. And so in the state of Utah, we're concerned that when we have a, a major community-wide disaster, that people will uh, lose sight of the historic materials or the artistic materials and, and focus strictly on uh, human life recovery. Human life recovery is absolutely the first priority, but it, we cannot forget that the cultural material is going to be um, damaged the longer we, we uh, wait to try and stabilize it, the worse it's going to get up to the point that it may not be recoverable. So we've added this annex to the um, state's emergency plan and, of course, hope we never have to use it. So prevention, I'm coming to the end of my time. I'm gonna run a little long. You're Seattle, you're special. So I've created a, a couple extra slides for you.
But um, first, I want to just talk about briefly the the concept of the uh, Florence flood and what did we learn. This is the uh, uh, an after uh, shot from the Florence flood from 1967. Uh, the flood itself is 66. The publication came. This was published in uh, National Geographic um, a few months after the flood. And here we see a bunch of conservators crouching down in a hallway, hovering over vellum books. Vellum is animal skin. It's a hygroscopic material, meaning it can change shape based on relative humidity in a room, much less being submerged underwater. All of these books were wet. All of these books are now interleaved and, and lying in this hall and people are scratching their chins. This is the before shot. Unfortunately, I don't have the after shot, but what I believe is none of those books look like that today, that they all distorted. There, there's severe damage as a result of this stuff getting wet. And the question I have is, when you're a city like Florence, Italy, and it floods every hundred years historically, why would you store a hygroscopic material of high value? Any, any one of those books is a $50,000 object and up. Why would you store vellum below the waterline in Florence? It's just a question. But what I think is every generation that has this event happen remembers that we don't want to do that. And it, it will not be um, below the waterline today. But eventually people kind of forget a few generations on it's it's a it, an idea that is you know not taken as seriously and so things get shifted around and storage in the basement is is a mandatory thing to deal with and so stuff gets put back down there vellum to to dry it we have to dry it under tension to actually get it to dry flat so things are humidified and stretched like this to take one of those books apart and stretch it would itself be a massive undertaking much less a whole hallway full of those books that last slide was a conservation nightmare. So what do we know about prevention? Well, this is a picture of a hope chest from um, 1770. And what we see is a box which gets valuable material up off the ground. The box would generally be stored at the foot of the bed, which is in the human comfort zone. And the lid is not gonna fit um, tight. It's just a wooden box with a wooden fitting lid. So there's going to be a slight amount of airflow. Think of that cave scenario. So we've got it up off the ground a little bit. So when there's standing water, hopefully it will be sufficient that it doesn't get wet. Notice that that's about three inches, which is what standard shelving in libraries is um, raised up off the, it's a lousy sentence. Shelving in libraries is as a standard raised up off the floor about three inches. So this is an, uh, an interesting idea in that we can Think about put, protecting things in physical barriers from water and uh, within the human comfort zone, they'll actually travel through time very well. Granted, the box is acidic, it's a wooden box, but um, people that used hope chests knew not to put the, the wedding dress or the christening gown directly up into the box, but wrap things carefully and put them away inside of the hope chest. So we can do that in, in library world or archives world or in any collection when we think about our storage. Uh, we think about, can we package things such that it will travel through time fairly well? I've seen a box like this, an archives box, di directly underneath a broken pipe. And the box shed water for some time. And yet, when, you know, we took the, you know, the water ran for 40 minutes. And so the material, when we, uh, salvaged the box was wet inside, but not soaking wet. It was it was pretty wet, but um, three feet from the box that was directly underneath the pipe break, things uh, got splattered and were damp, but were not soaking wet. And three feet more um, on the shelf, things were not damaged at all. So the boxes themselves will take a hit and provides um, a barrier from direct contact and boxes come in all shapes and sizes, and it's a great thing um, to, to try and protect the collection. Which brings me to the last piece, which I inserted just for you guys, because Seattle is an earthquake zone. So in a seismic zone, what do we know, right? Well, this is the earliest example of an earthquake-resistant structure. 
it's I Iranian and fourth century BCE, and it's a tomb. And the idea of setting the tomb on that, that substrate, that strata of rock, was that the rock itself would move and react to the earthquake and spare the tomb. And it's lasted for uh, low these many years. And so it it's possible they got it right. In modern buildings, we'll see the use of these uh, K braces to uh, stabilize buildings so that in fact the earthquake will shake the ground, the building will shake, but not, um, not torque so much that it physically falls down. They're good uh, for minimizing that. So we're starting at the outside, you know, the, big, the biggest size and moving inward. So the building itself can be stabilized. Of course, this is expensive. This is a, um, an isolator that was um, put underneath the city county building in Salt Lake City. And the theory is that these isolators will move when the earth shakes in Salt Lake City because we're in a seismic zone here and the building will not move. And so we hope that that actually is true. Inside of the building, moving inward, so at a, a smaller level, if we have all of these uh, stacks available to us when uh, we were renovating the building, we wanted to brace them to the concrete pad of the building. So the stacks will move, the building will move, but they won't fall down, which means that people won't get crushed between the uh, weight of the steel and the books on those shelves. So it's for human life safety, but I'm interested in protecting the material as well, which takes me to the story of the egg carton. The way um, eggs were moved in the 19th century and prior to that was to layer them between folds of an egg blanket and draw the eggs to market uh, in the uh, back of a horse-drawn wagon. The idea of um, the egg carton is not developed until, believe it or not, 1911, and it happened in rural Western Washington, uh, Canada, just above you. So it's it happened uh, because uh, the, a farmer was bringing his eggs to the uh, Aldemir Hotel in a, a rural town, and the farmer considered breakage part of the deal. He was moving his, his eggs to the hotel to sell them, uh, and he thought of the, um, the breakage as being part of the expense of moving them. Well, but the hotel basically said, we're not going to pay for breakage. And so there was a standoff that was uh, settled by Joseph Coyle, who's the founder and operator of the Interior News, which was a newspaper in nearby Smithers, British Columbia. And so Joseph Coyle um, thought about the problem and came up with what was called the Coyle Egg Safety Carton. And this is a great model for us thinking about moving stuff through time when we have uh, rocky roads ahead, right? So the, the coil egg carton basically isolated the egg and minimized its contact with other eggs and, there, and works pretty well to this day. It, prior to coil, no one thought about the cost of you know, protecting eggs. And today you don't think twice about buying eggs in an egg carton and taking them home. That's just a built-in cost and we all accept that. It took Coil many years, uh, by the way, to actually get the egg carton up in running and popular. It took uh, like the rest of his life, but it, it did catch on. So when we're thinking about the most fragile material that we own, what can we do in advance of an earthquake to protect it? So in, in this case, I'm worried about glass plate negatives and lantern slides, which were you know, found in my library in boxes like this where it's glass to glass stored in little drawers that are sitting on shelving and they're gonna fall off of the shelving when the building moves because of the earthquake and the shelving rocks back and forth and that whole box is gonna hit the ground and they're all gonna break. So the idea of protecting them made uh, sense because in essence, not doing anything about seismic risk is accepting the reality that you were going to get breakage. And so the question is, uh, Jerry Padani put it well, uh, what, can you, what can you envision living without? Because in fact, you may be making that decision by not taking action. So what we did was purchased uh, steel doors to put on the face of these normal shelves 
these are just bookshelves, but we added the doors. They were about $800 a pair, and they're uh, fastened to that the bookshelving. And then each of the glass plate negatives or lantern slides was put in a paper folder, which was put in a foam uh, padding and separated from the other uh, glass in, in this box. The boxes are standard archival size boxes. They're, um, they come, you know, the glass plates come in different sizes and archival boxes come in different sizes. So we can act accordingly. So we'll pad the, these things out with an inert foam padding. And then we're building something that will sit on the shelf and house this, uh, syst it's part of the system and it's made out of coroplast. And so we're, we've measured this to fit the shelf exactly. And now we're creasing it and folding it and building this container that will sit on the shelf and it will have a closure of Velcro, which is being attached there, and foam inside of it. So the glass plates are going to float inside of a padded uh, space. And so that's being configured a little bit. Now we see uh, Frank putting the foam inside of this uh, coroplast enclosure, which is measured exactly to fit the shelf. And uh, the glass plates are stored between these um, foam uh, padding, this foam padding, and closed up. And then each of those uh, containers is closed with the Velcro. But of course, that doesn't keep them in place. The doors have a locking system on it. You can see in the very front of that slide the black thing that is uh, part of the locking system. And that can, uh, let's see if I can do this. Yep, boom. So this, this lock system right there has to be uh, kept in a locked state, but that puts a metal rod up inside of the steel frame of the shelving. And so the, um, uh, the glass plates are not gonna rock around. Our papyrus collection was stored in these uh, map drawers. And so we put it inside of a foam pa uh, packing, but of course it's not really enough. So what we decided was the papyrus should be separated from the other uh, papyrus mounts. These are just standard glass mounts for papyrus that are taped at the edges. That's the way they came to us. And so the boxes are uh, configured like a puzzle inside of these drawers and the extra space is taken up with coroplast or foam so that they won't rock around. So there is no motion to rock these things when the earthquake happens. The drawers are going to lock and the, the case is bolted to the floor. Um, with we have some NASA rocket models. The president of the University of Utah went ahead, went on to be the head of NASA for a couple of terms. And on his death, we got these models, including this seven and a half foot tall uh, Saturn rocket model. You know, it's a handmade NASA piece, pretty interesting as an object. So we put it in this, um, uh, this container. This is like a gantry system. We've got uh, supports around it that are made of foam and covered in cloth and uh, that was designed to strap to the um, supports uh, that are holding up the floors of the building. So in theory, the, the building is going to move and that rocket's going to move with the building, but we hope it's not going to fall over and, and become damaged. Um, nearing the end here, this is um, a seismic shock cord, which was developed by a company called Tribe One in Layton, Utah, to help us out with a problem of keeping uh, glass objects. These are framed objects on the shelf um, and they're easily removable. That was the secret of what they had to develop. How do you fasten that to the existing shelving? And they're inexpensive. And the last thing I wanted to mention is the idea of mounting paintings and framed works so that they don't fall off the wall and sit in the water uh, if they're broken pipes after an earthquake. So the key to this system is this uh, T um, T screw and quickly you must know about this but um, libraries are kind of slow to come to some of these things so consider it a discovery from our point of view but it will be a three-point hanging system and the two top pieces are going to attach uh, to the wall on a hook and the bottom one is adjustable so that it can be locked uh, inside of a plate on the back of the, the uh, painting so that it can't be um, stolen easily. It's a security system uh, as well as a, a seismic preventive system. So that's what I know about trying to uh, 
prevent breakage in eggs. And with that, I think we're done. So uh, do you have any questions? And thank you very, very much for your, your patience. That was a long It was wonderful. Show. Thank you so much, Randy. Especially grateful that you took the time to put together some content that was specific to this group. So uh, thank you for that. We did have one question come in, and I would encourage you uh, all to go ahead and type any additional ones um, at this time. But uh, when you were discussing um, drying techniques earlier, Randy, Corey was wondering, where would you find um, the kind of vacuum chamber that you had referenced? Um, the vacuum chamber is, um, um, you know, if you're on a campus, they often have them for, you know, really small uh, units exist on uh, university campuses. So you might find things in Seattle that I, I'm unaware of. But uh, I, I mentioned uh, Kirk Lively and Belfour before, and Kirk is my go-to person. Belfour is a, um, an international company that has offices in um, uh, various places around the country and in, in Vancouver. And they have uh, two or three vacuum freeze drying chambers. And so certainly that's an option uh, to contact them and uh, inquire about the pricing and the the time it would take to freeze vacuum freeze dry material. Is that an adequate answer or and and Gary can help you with that. Gary is is familiar with Bell 4 and their services. Yeah. Um didn't see a, oh okay there's I thought I saw Corey typing a follow up. Okay, so she's wondering if you could go over how to protect uh, responders, protect themselves. Um, for example, when to wear masks. If there are outside floodwaters involved, should we always assume the water is contaminated? Should we rinse everything in clean water before packing out or air drying? Oh boy, that's a complicated question. You know, the, the answer is it depends. Um, when, um, when we're dealing, the, the, uh, is it Lindsay no, who asked Corey. the question? Corey, sorry. Corey, that's a great question. Um, there are a lot of variables. And when we're dealing with unknown factors, it's likely that we're, we're probably, uh, that there are going to be things that are occurring that are um, unexpected. I, I like to equate this to, you know, my office on a good day is, uh, it's friendly to me. I have pictures in my office that are, are you know, family members. I have uh, candy bars in the drawer for, uh, you know, my three o'clock slump. And it's a place that I feel really comfortable. But after a building wide event, it's likely that the comfort zone of my office is not actually what it was prior. And it's possible, in fact, that it's uh, dangerous. So we want to take great um, caution in uh, jumping into a situation where something is as as major as, for instance, an earthquake has happened, and um, you guys know that better than anyone because you you get some earthquakes out there with regularity. And so, what was a friendly building may no longer be a friendly building. What was grounded wiring, for instance, could have been disrupted in the earthquake, and it could now be that the wiring is not grounded. Things can change. The floorboards. Um, on a dry day in a small historical society might be perfectly sound. And when things got wet, it weakened something. And maybe one of the stairs is actually um, unsteady at this point. And if you step on it, you'll break it and or you'll slide off it because it's slippery. So, you know, there's mud layer on things. And so things can be risky, not just wearing a mask, but in every, every way things can put you at risk. So being cautious about uh, getting uh, in harm's way is a great idea. Going inside of buildings should be something that's uh, done with thoughtfully. So after the, um, you know, the water has been pumped out, going into a building, being aware that things have been disturbed is a, a bright idea. Some people have no business going into uh, a disaster um, zone after a, 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 an occurrence. Maybe they're not in good health. Maybe they've been sick. Maybe they're mostly depressed and they really, it won't help them to go into a really depressing situation 
if they've got a lot of attachment to the way the building used to look because it doesn't look like that now. And so being really kind about defining who should be uh, a person or and going in teams makes perfect sense. Um, so protections, it, it may be that you're dealing with a post flood or a post fire and wearing protective clothing like boots and, and uh, overalls, uh, certainly a respirator. Um, it's not uncommon for buildings to contain asbestos. Uh, asbestos was stirred into everything for up, up until I think the 70s. It's really late and they were, they were mixing it in with, um, it's in ceiling tiles, it's in floor tile, it's in, um, I've seen it in my building, it was stirred into the concrete of the building itself, which means if the building itself was, was compromised, i.e. a car drove into the side of the building and we all rushed in to see if the driver of the car was okay, the, the stuff in the air might contain asbestos. And as long as it's bound up in the concrete of the building, it's not a problem. But as soon as it's, it's free floating asbestos, breathing that stuff is absolutely hazardous. And so, um, and, and a, a dust mask isn't good enough. That's not fine enough for the kind of uh, problem that asbestos um, uh, provides. So we need actually fitted respirators. And to wear a respirator, you, you need to be tested and the respirator needs to be uh, you know, sealed to your face so it actually makes contact with your face. So you actually don't breathe the asbestos. People after 9-11 rushed in and of course they would rush in. It's heartbreaking to know what happened to them when they did that. Uh, they breathed all kinds of stuff from uh, the, the building dust and it absolutely caused health risks. And I remember people saying, no, don't worry, that's not going to be a problem. They actually said that. And, you know, days later, two and three days later, and years later, there were the lawsuits began. There was, you know, there's a huge amount of damage that was done because of people being good Samaritans. So certainly there's, there's no reason to put you, yourself, or anyone else at risk um, and it may not be it's the kind of thing that a person who's unfamiliar with a disaster scenario should be exposed to. There are professional uh, recovery people available to do work like this, and they're in and out of buildings with regularity. I mean, firemen run into burning buildings. That's the craziest job in the world. But um, they don't feel they're putting themselves at risk and often are not because they understand the variables. And so there's a, a bunch of things that need to be addressed um, before getting uh, into involved. Should it be? Should everything be rinsed? And and you know these these are questions. In the Florence flood, they asked the same questions. 1966. Should we be washing things? Everything was covered in mud. But the reality was there's so much damage and there's so much pressure to try and save all of that stuff there certainly was no time to wash things in the moment. If it's a small event, I, absolutely, that's a consideration and should be factored into other variables. Will washing, in fact, help? Just because it got dirty doesn't mean water is going to help it because, in fact, some media has got water-soluble uh, elements to it. It may be that, that getting it wet will cause things to run further and, in fact, leaving the stains in place is the best option. But we, we don't know enough without doing a bunch of experimentation. So it's possible that just stabilizing things by putting them in a freezer and then being able to take them out after uh, things slow down and we can ask questions about specific media makes more sense. Certainly deciding things in a mass way on the fly and is that, very maybe difficult. You gave an answer um, to that using a phrase that uh, several other presenters have used, it depends. Um, so it's a familiar refrain, I'm sure, for uh, those of you who have tuned into uh, all of these seven programs to this point. But um, I think Corey raises an excellent question, though, of um, just making sure that there's at least some awareness of what uh, the incident was and what materials you're, you're dealing with. And um, Randy, make... oh, go ahead. And if I could just add to, to Corey's observation, Corey, you know, the idea of having a respirator, it's part and parcel with that team that, that Jess is sending into North Carolina 
it's my assumption that all three of those people have respirators in their their backpacks where they're going and probably gloves and probably boots and um you know so it's part of the the um equipment that you would want to have on hand i think Great. well um we're getting close to uh the end of our time together so i did want to make sure i shared the uh survey link so you all should know the drill at this point you could just go ahead and fill out that very quick survey monkey um that helps us get some feedback on this program and um I want to give a big thank you to Randy, and this is such fantastic content you put together, and especially grateful that you tailored it to the needs of the community in Seattle. Thank you all for joining us today, and um, we will see you back here in the meeting room in two weeks' time for our, our final program. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, and especially Jess. It's been a privilege. Y'all have a good day. Take care.